Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I take great pleasure in welcoming each one of you to this session on the International Solar Alliance, The Road Ahead. So without further ado, I would invite uh, respected Mr. Rakesh Kumar, Program Director and Senior Consultant, International Solar Alliance India, to come to the stage and chair the session. May we have a round of applause for sir, please. <clears throat> I would also like to invite our speakers for today. Mr. Anuj Sess, Manager, Skill and Technology, Clean India. Dr. T.S. Pawar, PhD Director, Climate Change and Energy Program. Mr. Atul Bhatnagar, Business Advisor, Sun Moksha, India. Mr. Rohit Dhar, Director, EPC, Vikram Solar, India. Mr. Zakir Khan, Watsila, India. Ms. Anjali Vishwamohanan, Program Associate, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. And her Excellency, Janaiba Jagne, Zambian Embassy. I would uh, request uh, Mr. Rakesh to start with the session. Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, welcome to all distinguished panelists for this session. International Solar Alliance, the road ahead. Before I begin, let me give a little brief about International Solar Alliance, and then we will go to the panelists one by one and have their views. International Solar Alliance was launched uh, on the sidelines of when Paris Agreement was being signed in Paris. The organization happened to be an imagination of our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, and supported by France, and in the presence of United Nations Secretary General, ISA was launched. ISA's framework agreement was opened for signing by countries, and as you are aware, uh, the countries which are between Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer, those countries are high sunshine areas. And whether you are into this band fully or partially, you are the prospective member. So 121 prospective member countries uh, were there for ISA. And we have crossed the 50% mark in the sense that almost 63 countries have already signed the ISA framework agreement. Means they are on board for ISA programs. Out of this, 33 countries have ratified the ISA framework agreement. On 6th of December 2017, ISA became a legal entity because there was a condition that when 15 countries ratify, then it becomes a legal de jure entity. And uh, many of you might have seen that the ISAF foundation ceremony was organized on 11th of March in the August presence of Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, and French President, where head of states of uh, almost 20 plus countries from Africa and across the globe were present. ISA has launched four programs so far, and there are some which are under draft stage. The program one is on scaling up solar application for agriculture use, which basically is 
solar irrigation pumps. And this program, basically the idea that we are having in mind is that in consultation with the member countries, we would like to aggregate the demand. Uh, we will be working on quality and specification aspects and also come out with an international price discovery mechanism for the countries. And because scale has a strength and it will also give visibility to the manufacturing industry of solar pumps and there could be a more structured way of doing program and we'll be happy to know that we have been able to reach about 300,000 plus numbers of aggregation of solar irrigation pump. India has come out with 100,000 which might go up in the coming years. Then Bangladesh has come out with 50,000 irrigation pumps. That is their demand for next two, three years. Then Sudan is there, uh, Uganda has come out with 30,000, and so on and so forth. Our target is that once we have 500,000 numbers, uh, then we will be engaging an agency because ISA cannot do uh, uh, tendering part itself, so it will be taking help of associates and partners and run a competitive uh, price discovery mechanism. Uh, surely this will require the entire ecosystem of installation, operation, uh, maintenance for next five years, capacity building, because we hope that with this irrigation pump program, and many of the countries, as you know, we have irrigation challenges, and even food security is a challenge. So how to address that, how to improve the livelihood of farmers, and we hope that this program will have a very, very transformational impact on the, on the economy. And many of the countries have strong, I mean, weak rural economy, and we have to improve that. Program number two is about affordable finance at a scale. And we have been uh, trying to join hands with multilateral organizations, World Bank, ADB, name uh, any big organization and we are in discussion with them and we have been able to uh, have joint declaration with all those financial institutions about uh, helping the ISA program. Uh, for example, World Bank has committed 500 million US dollars for its program and many other banks are also uh, coming out in favor that we will be supporting. And of course, one of the important element of that will be the risk mitigation process, for which also some of our think tanks, and we have panelists among us who will be discussing that how the risk would be mitigated and how we can really scale up finance for such distributed nature of programs. Third program is about solar mini grid. As you know, energy access is a big challenge, not only in India, there are similar problems in Africa and many parts of the world. So suddenly with the development that is taking place in solar, technology has become quite uh, reliable. Uh, prices are coming down and we are <coughs> almost at the level of uh, grid parity in many parts of the world. So hopefully this program will again be able to improve the energy access situation in many countries. And wherever there is a problem of extending the grid, we can make use of uh, off-grid solar installations and villages can be electrified through either AC or DC systems. So this is program number three. Program number four is scaling up rooftop solar, which was launched on 11th of March, 2018. And this program, again, is all encompassing kind. This is a five years duration program, almost all of them. And uh, it's for off-grid, for grid-connected systems. Um, any kind of business model is allowed, any technology, because we are technology agnostic. And huge amount of work, of course, is uh, being done, has been done, and we require to do a lot of things. Capacity building, again, will be a very important element of this program. And there have been good contents, training programs developed, both in India and with some partners and on some other parts of the world. 
So we would like to have all these best practices and we will have training on and how to expand that training, how to support and definitely we will be needing technical assistance by way of some funding to run large programs where we can invite uh, uh, participants from member countries to come to our headquarters or to our associate partners or training institutions and we will also like the training institutions to go to those countries and have uh, training for training of trainers and to cover a large audience. So these four programs are already there and going forward we are going to have uh, solar park program, e-mobility and storage and also floating solar which is also now taking shape uh, around the world and we are seeing early days. But we definitely would like to have those programs. So broadly uh, we are trying to address many aspects or rather all aspects related to solar and International Solar Alliance is open to partnerships, alliances and uh, even civil society who can work for scaling up solar. So with this background, I would now uh, request uh, my panelists to uh, talk about it and I will go with the sequence. So the first speaker would be Mr. Anuj Says, Manager, Skills and Technology, Clean India. So may I request you to please, and since we have, uh, I, would, I would rather say that seven to ten minutes time, not more than that. Thank you. A very good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Anuj Khes and I work with uh, Clean Energy Access Network. On behalf of Clean, I would like to thank uh, Exhibitions India Group and ISA for inviting us. Uh, it's an honor to be here. In my presentation, uh, I'll take you through uh, what Clean has been doing so far. So uh, Clean is a network of decentralized renewable energy enterprises and organizations formed in 2014 uh, with a mandate to support and strengthen the decentralized renewable energy ecosystem in India. It's a registered uh, multi-state society. Uh, we had 13 founding members, namely Ashton India, Council of Energy Environment Water, GIZ, IRF, WWF, the Nand and Jeet Khemka Foundations, Selco Foundations, the Climate Group, Shakti, S3 IDF, United Nations Foundations, and Good Energies. Our resource partner is uh, USAID, and uh, we currently have 120 members across the country. Uh, we are a technology agnostic company working in uh, different uh, decentralized renewable energy technologies. Uh, the mandate that we have been given is to uh, support the system through our various programs and to uh, policy advocacy where we work closely with the policy makers and represent member voices to make the policy more conducive. In access to finance, we are facilitating a development of robust information system where uh, members and investors, investors can interact and mobilize funds. In the scaling part, uh, we interact with our members, we understand uh, what are their, uh, what is the gap uh, where scaling is required and we conduct uh, training programs through our partners. In technology and, uh, technology and innovation, we facilitate uh, development of technology standards through uh, pilots and aim to replic uh, with an aim to replicate and further scale it up for the DRE fraternity. In information and networking, uh, uh, our aim is to increase DRE outreach and spread awareness about decentralized renewable energy technologies. Uh, the last one, uh, which is the market, uh, which we are still working on, uh, the idea is to have a robust uh, decentralized renewable energy market in the coming years. Uh, this is our strength. Uh, these are our members. Uh, we are one short of... Uh, the number of um, ISA member countries, we are 120 right now. Uh, I'll just take you through a few key accomplishments which CLEAN has done uh, in the last three years. Out of 120 members, most of our members uh, are from solar enterprises. They work with mini grids, solar pumps, solar home systems, cold storage, 
etc. Apart from that, we have also members who work into biogas and uh, we have members from uh, cook stove business as well. In uh, policy advocacy, uh, we have contributed through various working group and uh, committee meetings uh, with policy framing authorities like Niti Aayog, uh, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, National uh, Rural Livelihood Missions. Then we have uh, two flagship events uh, which are organized annually. Uh, this is a platform where our members interact with the industry and we showcase their efforts. Um, efforts. Then uh, we have our regional member meetings uh, which are organized for our members uh, spread across the country. The recent uh, regional member meeting uh, was held at ISA Secretariat last month. Uh, then uh, we have a flagship publication uh, which is known as the State of the Decentralized Renewable Energy Sector of India. This was published last year. Uh, we are going to publish another one this year. And basically it highlights uh, the status of uh, DRE sector in India and what are the challenges and opportunities that lies beyond. Uh, in the skilling part, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, conduct training, we facilitate uh, uh, to conduct trainings for our members and these are a couple of training manuals uh, which uh, we have developed through our partners. Uh, not only in solar, but we also conduct training in other decentralized renewable energy technologies like the Pico Hydro training, which was conducted for our Northeast members in Meghalaya. And uh, these uh, training manuals are available on our website. It's free uh, and it can be downloaded. Uh, then we also facilitated in uh, development of two online applications. Uh, one is the decentralized renewable energy evaluation and monitoring tool. It's a, a financial assessment tool uh, for enterprises as well as for uh, investors. Then we have a solar troubleshooting application uh, which we uh, made it for our uh, mini grid operators. Then uh, these are a couple of interventions uh, which we are doing right now with our members. And, uh, there are a couple of uh, solar powered uh, DC applications, especially for rural livelihood, like the DC mixer, then uh, rice sellers. Uh, these uh, projects are still in pilot phase and are expected to be completed in the coming months. And uh, once uh, these pilots are over, uh, it will be uh, packaged together and uh, brought into the market. Uh, going forward, uh, we uh, want to further strengthen our uh, uh, membership and uh, with new initiatives and uh, value addition from our existing programs. Uh, I'll not uh, go through each of the activities that we have planned uh, because most of uh, the activities is in similar lines to what we have been doing uh, for the past three years. Uh, uh, th that's all uh, from my side. Uh, uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I'll be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, maintaining the time. I think the time is five minutes and maybe one or two minutes uh, for any questions. If So now I would request Dr. T.S. Panwar, Director, Climate Change and Energy Program, WWF India. Please give a round of applause. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I represent the organization WWF India, and as you are aware, it is a global network organization which has uh, offices in more than 100 countries. In India, we mainly work on uh, conservation-related issues, uh, work with remote communities in different landscapes of the country, and clean energy is one of the entry points for us to engage with the communities in these areas. So we have, uh, in the context of today's uh, discussion, I'll be focusing more on the mini grids, the solar mini grids, which we have been setting up uh, in different parts. So our main intervention has been in Sundarbans uh, and also in central India, as far as the mini grid installations we have done uh, in the country. 
So, uh, this slide here projects the Sundarban Tiger Reserve which is there and in the middle there is this island, Satjeli Island which has about uh, 40,000 people residing there and uh, when we engage with the communities from a point of view of conservation and for mitigating human wildlife conflict, so energy becomes one dimension where we sort of try to uh, bring in these clean energy sources and uh, uh, help, you know, mitigate this uh, wildlife conflict aspects as well. So here, what is represented here in this slide is the various microgrid, solar microgrids, which we have set up. And the idea was to sort of saturate this island with clean energy sources. Uh, so currently we have set up both AC and DC systems over there. Uh, we have five DC systems and uh, initially we started with a uh, 10 kilowatt AC uh, mini grid system, but now we have expanded to a charging station as well as uh, for charging electric vehicles over there. So the one on top is uh, we've set up these two charging stations for the e-rickshaws e which uh, would be applying there. So these uh, seven mini grids have been set up and as far as the initiatives go, as I mentioned, we started with this uh, mini grid AC solar power station, which was a 10 kilowatt community operated and managed solar power station. So this is the main emphasis. When we engage with the communities there, our in intention is to empower them and to entrust their after adequate capacity and training uh, needs are met, we empower them to operate it on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's an energy committee which is set up, which sort of collects the nominal charges from the community and operates it. So then we step back and it is the community which takes over and operates these systems. The current project which we are doing is Project Sahasra Jyoti, where we are focusing on DC uh, microgrids. And the intention here is to provide uh, these solar light, uh, solar uh, lights through the DC uh, mini grid to 1,000 households. And currently we have uh, done 512 and we are, would shortly be completing about 750 households but the intention is to sort of uh, complete these thousand households over there. And we have set up these five DC microgrids. Then, as I mentioned, in one of the islands, we set up a solar charging station. The batteries were charged, and then the charged batteries were taken to the different households who plugged it to the electric installations, the bulbs and uh, lights over there. And this is our uh, recent initiative in which we are trying to promote renewable energy-based transportation. So essentially the solar mini-grids provide the charging for the vehicles. So this is what we are engaging with the two gram panchayats in one of the island there. In terms of the context for today's discussion, our emphasis here is on this village energy service delivery model. And this is very important as far as the planning for the clean energy requirements in these villages is concerned. So the essential part is to engage the community and uh, discuss with them on their energy requirements and do this exercise called household energy budgeting, which is very important to understand what their uh, requirements are, what their ambitions are, and how much of that you can meet through these uh, mini grids. Uh, after that, there's this village mapping, layout, and development of the energy plan. We also handhold them, and this is a very important exercise in terms of formation of the village energy committees and their adequate uh, registration, so that these village energy committees are then empowered to uh, sort of collect the uh, nominal charges which they themselves decide, which should be adequate for the day-to-day -day operations of these uh, mini-grids. And, uh, then, of course, we help in this entire system design and installation through a technical partner. 
So this is the first model which we had set up, the 10 kilowatt uh, uh, mini grid. This was based on the bush light uh, energy uh, model which was uh, done by CAT projects in Australia. And the idea here was focusing on assessing the energy requirements and the community empowerment as far as the uh, clean energy service delivery is concerned. And this uh, project was uh, inaugurated in March 2011, and over these last seven years, it's been functioning uh, with a high degree of uptime, and the community there is quite satisfied with this. In fact, uh, the DG ISA, when he was secretary, MNRE had visited this, and he was also quite pleased with the feedback given by the community over there. Uh, as I was mentioning, we are now in this process, five DC microgrids with an installed capacity of 50 kilowatt have been set up, uh, uh, which is providing uh, household uh, sort of energy, both for lighting. So there are these LED, three LED lights provided per household. There's a fan provided, a DC fan, and a DC television. So each household gets about 50 watts of power, and uh, they are able to operate these appliances. The charges are decided by the community themselves, and currently they are in the range of about 50 to 60 rupees in some of the islands, and in other islands it goes up to 80 rupees per month. Uh, now in this change scenario, as uh, we, we all know in India especially, there is this aggressive program, and uh, all our villages are now technically electrified. And the next step is all the households should be electrified in, a, in the next year or so. So uh, in some of these islands, the grid has started coming, and, uh, but still there are issues with the quality of power. So currently, both the mini grids and the grids wherever it has come are surviving. But in the longer term, one will have to see uh, how do these uh, sort of uh, adapt to the changing circumstances and whether they act as a backup power or if these are cheaper, they still continue because uh, it's a problem in, for many of the villagers to pay the electricity charges, which uh, despite being in the rural areas are quite high for them. Uh, the approach which we use is to work with partners and in collaboration. So some of the partners here mentioned are, of course, supporting this work which we are doing in these remote areas. But on a technical front, it is Schneider Electric which is helping us with the, with the DC microgrids which we are setting, setting up, and also with the capacity building of the local youth and local people over there who can do the day-to-day -day maintenance and operations of these uh, plants. That is a very critical component because uh, to keep the faith sustained of the community in this, the uptime and the operations of these plants is, uh, should be very high. And that is why this local capacity building component is something which we uh, give high priority to. We also engage with many line departments of the West Bengal government, so there is this close co cooperation with the Webreda and other agencies, as well as uh, the, uh, the technical partners which are there. So uh, if I just sort of try to uh, draw the key points from our engagement so far and in the context of ISA, how does it apply? So one is our emphasis on the community operation and management, and more so from an empowerment perspective of these remote communities. And this village energy service delivery model, and especially the energy budgeting exercise which we undertake, is very crucial for the proper design of these uh, microgrids. The other thing which we found out is that the community there greatly values the street lights and the public institutions like school and the disaster uh, sort of relief centers which are there. So uh, they place a high emphasis on the lighting of the public institutions which are there. And one crucial uh, thing for us to sort of operate in these remote areas is to develop these partnerships and the capacity. And more so if we have many of these grids in a localized area, then the upkeep and maintenance becomes easier. So it is also important to see who are the other players operating in it and have some sort of tie-ups with them for a better upkeep. 
And uh, in the context of ISA, as I was discussing with Mr. Rakesh Kumar, that we have this network. There are a lot of offices in Africa which are there, WWF offices. And how is it we can take the learnings from some of our experiences here in India to other developing countries, especially in Africa? And uh, we've been in touch with some of them. Uh, we are, our African offices are members of the African Renewable Energy Initiative, which is there and probably there could be some sort of synergy with ISA in taking forward these learnings and uh, sharing with the African colleagues. Thank you very much. Now may I request uh, Mr. Atul Bhatnagar, Business Advisor, Sun Mocha, to give his presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all, um, my fellow panelists and members of the, uh, the, the session. I, um, I'm here to represent a company called Sun Moksh. Um, we have implemented microgrids, and the first ever microgrid that was implemented was in a village called Chutki uh, in District Angul in Odisha. So my presentation is going to be a lot of videos and a um, lot of uh, photographs to show the impact and very little to read from the screen itself. I know it's a post lunch session, so I'd like to keep you awake. Um, now, in this particular um, example that I'm just going to show you, it was Watsila, and I've got uh, Zakir here from Watsila to have provided us that initial funding to be able to do this entire village, which is in the middle of a tiger reserve, and there, the normal grid electricity would have never reached because the animal, animals would die. So here was a case where we had to work in a very remote site, having no, let's say, uh, uh, any kind of electrical connections to the outside world. So here is a small, um, I hope this thing moves. So this is a short movie. This is where it's kind of showing what happens there. Chotki, this sleepy hamlet doesn't just look like a lost paradise. The remote village located in a tiger reserve is not connected to the electricity grid, cutting off its 600 residents from the developed world. Most people here are farmers. They still follow a traditional way of life. But things are changing. For the first time, Chotki's residents have access to electricity, provided by this 30 kilowatt solar power plant set up earlier this year. It's part of a green technology project, the brainchild of social entrepreneur Ashok Das. We had given them 200 watts. He's partnered with local authorities to create India's first smart village in Odisha. Ashok's company has developed a smart nanogrid technology that allows the village's entire electrical infrastructure to be monitored remotely by the company's staff. Meters and sensors collect data on energy consumption making it easy to remotely manage supply and demand. Villagers pay tariffs based on how much energy they use. The company has also trained local youth from the village to monitor the system and detect any faults or overloading. They can even carry out basic repairs on the spot, ensuring the equipment is well maintained and running smoothly. Ashok says the model can be a game changer. By doing smart microgrid, what we are creating, we are creating a basic infrastructure we are creating a catalytic infrastructure on which many services will ride. Irrigation will ride, agricultural production will ride, uh, food processing can be done, cold storage can be done, health services will come, tele-education services will come. All of these together provide the development for the village. Many in the village are sensing new opportunities. Shrikant Adavar recently bought a photocopying machine and printer. In a makeshift office, he makes copies of ID cards and land deeds for his customers, as well as takes passport size photos. It's a crucial service in rural India, where citizens need those documents to apply for government loans and open bank accounts. Earlier, people had to travel 50 kilometers to the nearest town to get their documents photocopied. So I thought, now that we have reliable electricity, why don't I provide the services right here? It saves villagers time and money, and I supplement my own income. 
existing businesses too are seeing the benefits of uninterrupted access to power. As night falls, many can continue to operate. Street vendor Prabhakar Prusti also runs a grocery store. He now plans to invest in a fridge and offer cold drinks to his customers. Since we have electricity, my business has definitely improved. My shop can stay open till late in the night. I get more customers. For most villagers, the biggest changes since electricity arrived are simple. Street lights provide safety from wild animals, a priority in this tiger reserve. A few households have now got television sets, providing entertainment and drawing a large young audience tonight. Some even get to attend a coaching class in the village and do homework in the evening. Power that empowers. There are now plans to replicate Chotki's smart village model in other Indian states. So um, the opportunities that you saw in, uh, in the video, I'm just capturing it like saying what was from darkness to luminance, uh, that's how this whole village has transformed itself. Now, you've got sustainable energy, that's the focus. And I'll just elaborate on these points when I, um, I start off after the, doing this. This is very essential. We have trained local youth. This entire microgrid is based on IoT and is cloud-based. In terms of technology, it's so-called state-of-the-art. But being managed by people who are eighth pass in the village, they have to just look through three screens, that's it. And they have been running this for the last two and a half years. And this is because we took the local youth into this training pit of when we were implementing it, None of the people have to fly down there and do some fire fighting or troubleshooting. None of that's required. In the last two and a half years, the only intervention we had to make was when there was lightning and the inverter blew up. So we had to put in a new inverter. That's about it. So what are the impacts that we're seeing? I mean, after having done Chutki and having to now progress to other cluster of villages, we are seeing that what more can be achieved. So we are now talking of a microeconomic zone. As Ashok mentioned in that video, we are not only providing electricity. First of all, we are not against household electricity. That, that point, I'll, I'll park for the side. But what does household electricity really leave? I mean, if you provide 24-hour consistent household electricity, people will buy two fridges and two TVs and go to sleep and can't pay for it. However, if I were to provide 24-7 reliable, consistent power to, let's say, a microeconomic zone, it can be the panchayat bhavan, can be a barad ghar, can be a school in the night or whatever, and there, if I can provide a cold storage, in the cold storage I can provide, freeze milk for the uh, processing into paneer or cheese, or putting in the vegetables and sell when the mandi prices are high, I mean, in Madhya Pradesh, you're selling uh, onions at 30 paisa a kilo at this moment. However, if you kind of put them in a cold storage or cold, cold room, then you can sell them at 80 rupees a kilo. Of course, there was a time when onions were uh, 80 rupees a kilo also. But I'm just saying the whole idea is what is the microeconomic activity through which this power can be used. And once that microeconomic activity happens, the, the farmer is ready to pay for it. It's not about subsidy. It's not about trying to fleece them. If they see that if I put in a certain amount of money, my produce can get more things, that is what we have to do. So this is the microeconomic zone, very visible. And hub and spoke model, so microeconomic zone can be panchayat level and the villages can feed into it. There's the same thing for smart uh, aquanet. And this, this is the last slide. This is to show that the Chutki information is actually available to any one of us here. If you dial onto the net, you will be able to say which, which place where the electricity is being provided. In the morning, it can be in the fields. In the night, it can be at home. So it's a dynamic demand and supply model. If I were to just create this model on the desktop, it would have taken 45 kilowatts. But because of this dynamic demand supply management, it is 30 kilowatts. So the capex comes down. CapEx comes down, youth are empowered, it creates employment, creates entrepreneurship, allows the economy to, of the village to start, and that's what this Sun Moksh model is all about. Thank you. Now I may request uh, Mr. Rohit Dhar, Director EPC, Vikram Solar India. 
please restrict to five minutes, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here, and especially in the context of uh, the landmark initiative, ISA, which uh, uh, Mr. Rakesh Kumar talked about. Uh, this initiative is indeed a landmark initiative, and uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, in human evolution we are at a stage where energy security uh, and food security have got intertwined, and both these securities have got intertwined with the climate change, which is a reality. So both from the point of view of sustainability, from the point of view of clean energy, from the point of view of food security, this initiative uh, is indeed, uh, could not have been more timely. And as Victor Hugo once said so famously, he said, no one can resist an idea whose time has come. And obviously the time for renewable energy, clean energy and distributed energy has come. Uh, Vikram Solar uh, has been uh, a leading player and we have always been contributing to this cause of clean energy. We have been doing uh, large projects, utility scale, which mitigates carbon apart from generating uh, solar power. And we have been very active in distributed uh, with rooftops, with distributed. We have solarized uh, hundreds of schools um, on the small uh, system level. And uh, we have also done a lot of community work uh, by way of clean energy, more so in case of the rooftop power. And uh, we are uh, one gigawatt plus uh, Bloomberg tier one module manufacturer. So we are very much uh, part of the ecosystem providing impetus, not only in India, but also overseas as our PV modules are used in different geographies, different countries, including United States. Now, uh, in, 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 in this context, uh, you know, these are indeed exciting times for energy sector in general whether it is for energy generation or whether it's for transportation. We are um, witnessing a changeover, a disruption, which uh, is long overdue in a way, uh, where uh, we are moving away from fossil fuels to alternate energy generation, and uh, where actually uh, there is today a certain thinking and a question mark on the grid itself, because till now we are used to central, centralized power generation, using the transmission networks, distributing, and in a large and uh, vast country like India, it means a lot of cost. It means a lot of cost of building transmission networks, distribution networks, maintaining them, losing energy uh, in the process of this distribution, which anyway is not very efficient. Now, uh, distributed energy, which is especially carbon-free, presents a very interesting alternative. Because we have, after all, if we analyze what is grid itself, grid itself is a product of industrial revolution, post-industrial society, which was at that time a very inefficient, uh, a very inefficient means of uh, handling the energy needs of humans. And um, that kind of inefficiency is neither sustainable. And uh, we, 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 with, with uh, interesting developments taking place in the storage, with the uh, array of technologies coming about in storage with storage costs falling. So we see a lot of convergence between technologies, different technologies. For example, solar PV panels are getting better and better. The energy density is improving. The prices are going lower. We are seeing a jumble of uh, attractive technologies uh, in, on solar side, so it's getting better and better. I recall a few years back, five years back to be precise, when we started National Solar Mission in India, we, at that point in time, even in utility scale projects, we were using 230 watt peak. I think that's where we started, 230 watt peak modules. And today, we are already using 330. We are looking at monocrystalline, monoperk, 360, 365. Uh, in fact, uh, at Vikram, we have pioneered monocrystalline module perk, uh, which has lowest cost of energy. Alongside the emergence of cost-effective storage, is something which has huge implications, for not for only a country like India, where grid outage is a fact of daily life, but also in many other countries which are underdeveloped, where grid is not as efficient. Uh, we, um, we, we find that this convergence and this disruption, in a way healthy disruption, 
is going to transform the energy landscape. And uh, the solar uh, irrigation part has tremendous implications. It can be the path to power sector reforms and bankability if uh, we do it on a large scale as is being planned right now. The, um, e the electric mobility, shift towards electric mobility in transportation sector is going to mean cleaner air in cities which are clogged with pollution. So, uh, and on the generation side, uh, this storage plus this. So all these converging technologies point uh, to a very uh, different way of using and consuming energy and meeting our needs. And the initiative of ISA is a land landmark initiative which will facilitate tremendous amount of sharing, uh, expediting uh, emerging technologies, and also it will give the scale so that um, uh, funding is available and it is done at a strategic level. So with this, I close and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rohit Dhar. Now, may I request Mr. Jakir Khan, Watsila, India, to have his presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, audience, for patient listening to all the presentation till this time. Wow, what an inspiring story about uh, Chutki. You know, in, uh, in Indian context, Chutki means a small, and which goes with the small economy, the microeconomy, which, uh, you know, my colleague, Mr. Bhatnaga, talked about. And we are very glad to be associated with this Chutki project. And uh, now, basically, we, we are talking about a Badki, which is the larger, uh, I would say, economic scenario which, would have, which we ha uh, should uh, look at it. India is going uh, big time in solar. We all know uh, we have a very ambitious target of you know, 100 gigawatt on solar. So it's a massive, massive target. And then we believe at Watsila, we always believe, in fact, our reason of association with uh, Chutki was the project itself was sustainable. It was not, it, it wasn't a, uh, I would say, a gap funding or a subsidy model. It was a self-sustaining mo model, and that's the reason we associated with it. So we believe in sustainability. Any, anything which we try to develop, any solution which we try to develop, it has to be uh, sustainable. So the sustainability can only give rise to, uh, I would say, gl uh, growth of any technology which we talk about be it solar, be it any other technology which we uh, you know, think, of, think of. We have seen uh, a solar, uh, rather before solar wave, we have seen the wind wave, which has come big time. There were a lot of investment which has happened on wind, but then the reality is it is still uh, you know, finding it difficult to dispatch. There is a lot of uh, bankruptcy happening on that front because of the curtailment, because of pure reason of curtailment. The, the whatever generation is happening on wind is not able to, you know, dispatch it, and then there is underutilization of the asset. So we believe, since the subject is uh, you know, way ahead in solar, we believe that whatever investment we are doing it on solar, it should be self-sustainable, and it should have its full potential extracted from it, not the curtailment route. Otherwise, we are back to zero. COP21 is just the signature. We will not be able to meet those, uh, you know, I would say, uh, 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 the, the, the uh, benchmarks. If you have, hotel, again, the curtailment route happening on this 100 gigawatt of solar. So, as I said, we are a global player uh, providing solution in smart power generation. That's the uh, punchline. We are present all across globe. So this is the uh, triangle which I was talking about. Whatever solution which we think, it has to be have affordability, it should be sustainable, and it should be reliable. So when I talk about either a microgrid or a macro grid, it has to have these three fundamental, uh, I would say, uh, points to be considered. It has to be affordable because ultimately the customer are paying for whatever solution we are talking about. Then it should be sustainable. It should not be, uh, you know, it's just a gap funding that uh, regime provides a gap funding and then when the regime changes, the gap funding is not there and it becomes completely bankrupt. And it's have, it has to be reliable. So what we basically uh, seeing at the moment that solar, we have very uh, good intention of putting solar in India, but if I look at the entire generation mix, maybe I can replicate it to any other country also. One way we are putting a lot of emphasis on solar, but we are forgetting about the overall generation mix as a whole. We are, we are not really looking at the great security. We are not looking at the 
disruption which can be caused because of uh, solar unavailability because whenever solar is unavailable then we have a problem of you know going down with the grid if the conventional generations are not up to the mark or, or up to the speed to come to meet the shortfall of the solar. So, um, you know, what we have started to look at in Indian context because of solar coming in, uh, there is pressure coming on the conventional power generation in India. See, the PLFs of the plants which were uh, used to be 70% and above, the, because of the uh, solar coming in or renewable coming in, there is a pressure on this uh, uh, you know, power, power, power plant PLF. And reasonably, because energy is being drawn from renewable, this conventional plants which are uh, very, I would say, fixed type of operation of plants are not able to meet and they have to back down. So that's why their PLFs are coming down. So we believe going forward, when uh, full potential of solar will come in India, these plants will not be able to meet the cyclic nature of the renewable, right? So we need to have some kind of solution which addresses this. Either it should be a hydro potential which can come in a second, whenever there is a drop in solar because of uh, climate or because of cloud cover, there has to be a very quick response to uh, come in to maintain the grid, right? So it can be done by solar, it can be done by battery, or some technologies which are capable of responding to dynamics very quickly. So basically we are into that kind of solution which we, uh, which we provide, and we've been, in fact, advocating uh, at length at ministry. In fact, Mr. Upendra Tripathiji is not here. I have personally met him about you know, uh, providing this solution in the Indian context. This slide is very important because we are talking about going ahead on solar front. And uh, I would like audience to look at this slide. There is a huge, uh, huge price reduction happening on both solar as well as on battery storage. So there is uh, almost a learning curve of 20% on this. Uh, uh, I think there is a mistake here. Sorry. Yeah. There was a transition slide. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, huge reduction on battery storage as well as on solar. So going forward, whenever we think about a micro grid or a macro grid, we have to have a combination of solar with battery storage to make it sustainable, to make it dispatchable. So that, you know, uh, whenever we talk about solar uh, providing energy for, say, it's six hours, battery can complement it for another four hours, and rest of the time, it can be a, co a conventional power. So we basically talk about a hybrid solution, solar with battery storage or solar with any conventional uh, you know, power plant. Uh, we are also uh, you know, fast, uh, I would say, rather. We also provide power plant solution, which are very fast responding solution. So idea is, since we are talking about you know, future, when there will be a lot of solar coming in our grid, how best we can you know, safeguard the investment, how best we can make it sustainable so that whatever investment we have put in, it is going to be working and it is going to be sustainable. So uh, the need of the hour for the ISR and uh, as well as uh, for the stakeholder to look at it seriously, how best we can you know, combine this uh, individual boxes and make it sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackie Khan, for giving the perspective about how your uh, uh, projects can run in hybrid with solar and the possibilities of uh, looking at how RE integration could be better. Now, may I request Ms. Anjali Viswamohan, Program Associate, Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, to give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, we are uh, short on time, so please so make I it up. I'll try and wind up in five yeah. to six minutes. Five to six minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So um, my name is Anjali Vishwamohanan. I work as a program associate at the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, for those who, who are not familiar with CEW, is one of South Asia's leading policy research institutions, and we work across seven focus areas, including energy access, renewables, the power sector, industrial sustainability, and competitiveness, 
low carbon pathways, risks and adaptations, and technology, finance, and trade. CEW as an institution has been working with the International Solar Alliance even before its conception, and we continue to support the International Solar Alliance through our research and policy suggestions. Okay. So now when we come to ISA and the presentation today is focused on um, assessing ISA's roadmap from implementation to action. And I will explain why we have titled the presentation as such. So ISA is an organization with a very unique position to develop domestic solar capacity in ISA member countries to meet their solar ambitions. I'm not sure if everyone in this room is aware, but Prime Minister Modi had come out with a 10-point action plan for the International Solar Alliance at the ISA summit, which was held earlier this year on March 11th. So the 10-point action plan is, plan is essentially a guidebook for um, ISA in helping its member countries achieve their solar ambitions. So right from um, uh, ISA's initiation, uh, its focus was on three main areas, which includes facilitating solar finance, scaling solar application, and building solar research and development and capacity. Uh, so my aim through this presentation is to explain how a number of these action points have already been implemented through ISA's work programs and its focus areas and how it can be bettered to sort of better implement the action plans in ISA's day-to-day -day functions. So now to just go on to the 10-point action agenda items that was proposed by Prime Minister Modi. The overall themes, as you see from action point number one and two, is to sort of better the innovation potential of ISA and to encourage its availability and accessibility. Uh, action point number three is building on one and two to ensure regulatory revisions and um, standardization of procedures to implement, to ensure better implementation of the solar solutions that have been developed. Um, action point number five and six is on um, encouraging um, access to finance and also providing consultancy services for bankable solar projects um, across the ISA member countries. Um, action point number seven and eight is to ensure um, better capacity within ISA member countries through greater inclusiveness and building, a net, building an exclusive network of centers of excellence that will deal with the local problems in ISA member countries. And also there are a few broad, broader action points which include uh, number four, nine, and 10, which is to increase the solar proportion in the energy mix of each member country um, and to ensure that most solar policies are in line with the sustainable development goals and to ensure that the ISA secretariat becomes more strong and professional. Okay. Now when we go to the first, um, the value addition that we see in scaling solar applications, which is uh, one of the programs that uh, Mr. Kumar had mentioned in terms of solar pumps. So one of the main feet, uh, objectives of this uh, focus area is to ensure reliable, affordable, and tailored to need solar applications within the reach of all population in the ISA member countries. In order to adapt to realize this objective, there is a need to ensure that there is a um, common needs assessment, which is already being conducted by the International Solar Alliance through survey questionnaires, which is being circulated to all national focal points of the, of the ISA member countries through the NFP conclave and even otherwise. There is, uh, in order to accumulate advanced market commitments for solar applications, um, to ensure that uh, there is low cost manufacturing, there is a need to accumulate. Uh, these commitments, then also development of uh, fit-for-purpose business models and financing streams, and implementing common um, standards for products to ensure quality control across ISA member countries. So as you will see, this um, by doing this, we would fulfill action points number one, four, seven, eight, and nine of the action plan agenda. I'll just give you five seconds to just go through this. Okay. So then when we come to building solar research and de development and capacity, the objective here really is to facilitate the scaling up of both domestic and collaborati collaborative research and development projects within and between ISA member countries and also to ensure capacity building for both the International Solar Alliance and for its member countries. How this can be done is through implementation of mechanisms for aggregation of demand for venture capital to uh, facilitate resource flow to both innovators and innovations that have not evolved into commercial solutions. Then the implementation of um, ISA, ISA facilitated pilot programs for homegrown technologies that have not been tested as yet. 
uh, encouraging technology transfer through standardized training of professionals and identifying means to empower the ISA secretary to draw on ex existing capacity and international process protocol. As you will see, this sort of um, deals with action points number two, seven, eight, and 10 of the action plan agenda. Okay, and the, the last value addition would be on facilitating solar finance, which is the most exciting one for me because this is the part that I work on. So um, on affordable finance and scale, the aim is to reduce the cost of finance for each solar project. And also the overall broader aim is to, dev to sort of accumulate more than 1 trillion US dollars to implement in ISA, in, sorry, in, in PV assets in solar rich countries. And this aim is targeted for 2030 or earlier if possible. And this can be done through a three-pronged manner by working on standardized contracts, a harmonized tendering process, and de-risking mechanisms, which includes the common risk mitigation mechanism that Mr. Kumar had talked about earlier. I will be talking about this further in my next slide. So um, by uh, improving this facilitating solar finance objective, we would be dealing with um, action items number one, three, four, five, six, and seven of the action plan agenda. I will just give you 10 seconds to go through that. OK. So the common risk mitigation mechanism is a tool that was developed by the TerraWatt Initiative, the Currency Exchange Fund, the World Bank Group, the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, and the Confederation of Indian Industry. It, um, it, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's one way of operation, operationalizing ISA's program on affordable finance at scale. And it was initiated by both India and France, but it was contributed to by other member countries as well. Uh, so this tool is open to all nations on a voluntary basis to share and aggregate their financing needs for solar production, production assets and pooling risks of eligible portfolios of solar assets and mitigating these risks through the common mechanism, which is the CRMM. So this, um, this is essentially a guarantee that deals with non-project risks, including foreign exchange risks, risks of transfer and con inconvertibility, uh, counterparty risk, which includes off-taker risk, and political risks associated with countries. So just to give you like an overall look of how um, the CRMM looks like, it's, it, um, there are two entities that will be created by the CRMM, one which is the platform, which is in charge of aggregating projects from different uh, member countries and uh, judging their eligibility. It will then be transferred to the guarantee facility, which, which will provide 100% guarantee for the risks that I had mentioned earlier. So 90% of these risks will be um, reinsured from um, the insurers and reinsurers that are mentioned on the right side, um, right side of the slide. And 10% of the risks will be funded through the shareholding structure of the guarantor, which would be through uh, funding from both DFIs and the uh, countries that will be contributing to the overall fund of the guarantor. We see this as a mechanism that would, uh, I'm almost done. So we see this as a mechanism that would be, that would really benefit the, the projects that are eligible and bankable and, and are uh, a judge so by the platform. And right now, um, the CRMM has been approved uh, at the ISA summit that happened earlier this year. And it is being um, tested at the World Bank facilities, and we should see it in action in a year or so from now. So that's all I have for now, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Anjali, for sticking almost to time. Now, we are very privileged and proud to have among us Her Excellency Jeneba Jagne, Ambassador from Gambia. and. Uh, I would request her to give her intervention and talk a little about the solar journey that Gambia has taken and what are your expectations from International Solar Alliance. This is one. We are also privileged to have, of course, in the audience, Ambassador from Mauritius, and I would also like to have his views after you have intervened. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have to say well done to the presenters. 
this is the most difficult time of the day to give a presentation when everybody has had their dal and their chapati and they're all sleepy. So you've done a really good job um, keeping the crowd engaged. I'll keep my statements very short as well. Uh, it was just a quick opportunity to talk a little bit about the Gambia. Uh, I'll keep it short, one, because everybody's sleepy, and secondly, because this bell is really loud up here. <laughs> I don't want him to ring it on me. Um, the Gambia is a signatory to the International Solar Alliance Framework, and um, we will be ratifying it as soon as um, National Assembly goes um, back into, um, into the House. Um, but just to quickly um, tell you that there are several opportunities in the solar sector in the Gambia. Right now, we have about 70% um, electrification in the urban areas and only 15% in the rural areas. So there's several opportunities for um, the business people here. There are several opportunities for um, organizations and so on who want to engage uh, with the Gambia on the solar front. We have um, you know, three sources of uh, potential resources for electricity generation. That's the solar wind and uh, biomass. I, uh, from a different group, I'll be talking to them about biomass and wind, but for uh, solar over here, uh, somebody had mentioned earlier about the development of um, mini grids, and this is one of the initiatives that the Gambia has. We do want to develop um, green mini grids, and we have a country program for that. So um, all those who are interested in that uh, can come to the embassy and we'll have a, a chat about that. Um, as soon as the gentleman over here sat down, I gave him my card because um, skills development is one of, um, you know, for me, my pet passion anyway for all the sectors and especially in um, renewable energy. So we, um, capacity building is one of the areas that we need a lot of um, work with as well. We will um, be putting interested parties in touch with uh, our two ministries responsible for that. That's the Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology, and the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. Now, the Minister for Petroleum and Energy has been here twice over the past three months. And this is just to show you how much he wants to engage with the sector um, in India. And um, they have several programs, the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy also for... Um, putting solar panels in 100, I think it's 10,000 or 100,000 homes in the Gambia. Again, anybody who wants information on this can contact the embassy and we'll, we'll provide this information. Um, the, the chairperson over here had spoken about one of the ISA programs having roofed up um, installation of solar panels and things like that. So I think those things will, will fit in very well um, with the program from the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. Now, when um, I'm sure you know, one of the questions that will, will come up is, always comes up when you talk about any country that you want to engage with, the first thing they'll ask you is, oh, what's your population size or what's your country size? Now, the Gambia is one of the smallest countries in, in the whole world. We have a population size of about 1.9 million people. And as soon as you say that, uh, two things happen. One, um, laughter. <laughs> like it's happening over here, and two, uh, roll of the eyes and, and, and um, lack of interest. But one thing I can say is that the Gambia is part of the economic community of West African states. That's 15 member countries in West Africa. This includes the bigger population countries like Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, and the smaller ones like Cape Verde, Guinea, uh, Conakry, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, and, and, and so on and so forth. So you have access to a population of over 350 million um, people. Obviously, with most of them having disposable incomes and most of them having um, major electrification and renewable energy projects. So you do have access to all of those um, ECOWAS member states through the Gambia. One thing, one advantage that the Gambia does provide um, as compared to our um, sisters and brothers on, on the coast is that we have some of the cheapest tariffs at our ports. So you will find all the other countries that have uh, their own seaports will actually uh, um, disembark their, their containers and their cargo in the Gambia and they have their trucks and their, their vehicles ready to take their products out into those various countries. So for all of you business people over here who want to go out and sell your solar panels and your batteries and things like that, a gateway to have access to all of those countries is the Gambia. We have something that is called the free movement of goods and people amongst all the West African, um, all the ECOWAS member countries. 
So when your goods come in through the Gambia at the, at the cheaper tariffs and obviously at the cheaper um, cost of living in the country and so on, it's, it's easy to disseminate your products to these countries. And the Gambia offers the advantage, or, well, Okay, English speaking um, country, I was about to say the advantage of that we're both colonized by the same people, but that is not an advantage. But we both um, have English as our official language. And we're surrounded by Francophone countries. So one of the easiest ways to penetrate those Francophone countries um, is through the Gambia. We are also um, signatories to several, um, several acts and, and, and policies and so on internationally that allows for um, joint and multilateral, bilateral um, corporations and so on. One of them obviously being through the, the ISA for you business people here interested. Um, the, the, the chairperson has spoken about the different programs under the ISA which you could get involved in um, through ISA with, with the Gambia. Um, we, I, I don't want to sound like a tourist video over here, and I don't want to hear that bell, so I won't go into all of the advantages of why you should pass through the Gambia. But I invite you to come to the embassy, and we will, we will discuss that. Now, in terms of um, our expectations from the International Solar Alliance, which um, the chairperson had asked me to, to mention, um, upon you know, the signing and ratification and so on, there are products that, projects that we've already discussed with the um, acting um, Secretary General of ISA. But in general, it will be things like um, policy support and, and project management, um, the monitoring and evaluation of um, projects that are ongoing and projects which we will be implementing in the future. Uh, the uh, last speaker mentioned about research and, and development and um, data collection and so on. So those are the things that we would be you know, looking to work together with, um, with ISA. And assistance with the quality assurance of most of the solar products that will be coming into the Gambia, the solar panels and the, um, the batteries and, and so on and so forth. And um, the most important would be obviously technology transfer amongst all of these. I mean, you, I, I have a huge respect for the Knowledge Society of, of India. My counsel sitting here over here will tell you um, in terms of your technology and, and everything else. So this is, this is an area that we will be looking to, to gain support. Um, from the from the ISA, and I, I again I think I'll keep keep that short over there, but um, we do have um, one major project that we could work with with ISA and and other interested parties, and this is the formation of the Rural Electrification Agency in the Gambia. Um, one of the speakers there spoke about Ashok Das, who had set up something like that for you know one of the villages that was surrounded what in the middle of a tiger park. Um, these are the kinds of projects that we would we would want. And um, since they have had something that has been successful and been working for the past two years, um, you know the technical expertise would be greatly welcome in in something like that. So you know just to uh, reiterate, we seek partnership with you know all of you from the business part of things, from the research and development aspect of things. Um, um, from the multilateral um, uh, corporation um, part of things. And you're more than welcome to come to the Gambia. I'll tell you a little bit more and show you how beautiful the smiling coast of Africa is. Thank you. Some quick comments. Uh, first of all, when I smile, it was not because you're small. Small is beautiful. Uh, Mauritius is also a small island, but a uh, beautiful island. Uh, in fact, uh, whatever you have said, we will be committed to support from ISA side. Uh, in fact, quickly I will tell you that we had had two conclaves of national focal points. All countries who have signed ISA framework agreement, they have identified a single nodal point as national focal point. And we had two conclaves in India uh, near our headquarter and some of the think tanks were working together to have a road map uh, which uh, was also about policy and how solar should evolve in the country. And I think we'll be very happy to see, go through your policy, whether it is uh, progressive enough, and if there are some suggestions which can be done uh, uh, to make it happen, uh, what we want to achieve. Uh, in fact, uh, another point which I wanted to say was there is a discussion among ISA and of course uh, some directions from the president and co-president of, you know, chair and co-chair of India and France, that uh, some delegations should visit Africa and uh, interact with them because it is easier for a small delegation to address large number of people than uh, calling people here. So West Africa is on 
our <coughs> engagement. And we are also talking to ECRI, which is one of the ECOWAS region, uh, ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. So we are trying to have a tie-up with them and also with uh, African Renewable Energy Initiative. So uh, we will be engaging very closely with all the countries. And uh, of course, as you said, Gambia among all Francophone countries is English speaking. So it will be maybe easier for some of the Indian companies to start uh, having inroads in other countries through Gambia. So thank you very much. <coughs> uh, now, sir, if I may request uh, Ambassador His Excellency from Mauritius, if you can also give us a little view about your expectations about ISA. You have been very active in our programs and also in our discussions. So we we'll value your thoughts and uh, uh, we would invite you. Maybe you can use the uh, stage or you can use the mic. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you. So yeah, thank you. Uh, you almost took us by surprise by inviting us to give a small uh, brief introduction about Mauritius. But first of all, I would like, of course, to, uh, on behalf of His Excellency High Commissioner, to thank you for giving us this opportunity. And as uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador from Gambia, the Gambia said that uh, the Gambia is small, but Mauritius is even smaller, right? Our population is 1,000 times smaller than India. You are 1.2 billion, we are 1.2 million. So you can imagine the scale and the size. But this doesn't mean that there are, not op there are no opportunities. I mean, Mauritius is known for its beauty, for its tourism, for its, uh, a, I mean, holiday and wedding, uh, honeymoon destination and all. But at the same time, it has a lot of business opportunities, which, of course, includes uh, renewable energy sector, uh, solar energy. So in terms of the renewable energy sector, today we are at 20% in terms of renewables, which is uh, mostly comprised of 17% uh, rather biomass, which is sugarcane bagasse, and then the rest is hydro, uh, solar, and also some uh, wind power. So that's 20%. But the objective is to reach 35% by 2025. That is within seven to eight years, we have to reach 35% which will again include those main uh, uh, renewable energy sectors, solar, wind, even uh, like if we can have offshore wind power, that also will, be, will, will help. In terms of uh, the existing scenario, uh, we have set up, now Mauritius, we have set up, I mean, we have our main distribution company, which is a central electricity board, but now uh, government has also set up a new agency to look at renewable energy uh, solutions and projects. All the renewable energy projects which, come, uh, which are set up in Mauritius, they are all tender-based. Government will launch tenders, and then based on those tenders, the successful bidders implement the project. So like this, we have a project of uh, 15 megawatt of solar running right now. Uh, that's one, but of course, in the future, we will have more. And we also have uh, individuals which have installed uh, rooftops. I mean, uh, PV, uh, solar modules and rooftop, and which they are, uh, they are uh, how to call this? I mean, they are running these projects on their own uh, domestic individuals. At the same time, the excess is returned back to the grid. So the excess is sold to the grid, and then that's uh, the way it is running today. But this is a very small scale at, I think, around two or three megawatt in total, right? In fact, our peak demand is nearly at 700 megawatt. So that's how big we are. I mean, if, if you look in terms of the scales, 700 uh, uh, megawatt, the peak demand is, which uh, comprises 80% of uh, coal and imported fossil fuel. So that's how it is. And the 20%, as I, as I said, it is renewable. So uh, what, what, what the next step is now for government to increase that 20% to 30, 35%, that is 15%. And this is where I believe that Mauritius, having been a founding, founding member of the ISA, you have signed and we have also ratified the agreement. So uh, being a founding member, now we look up in terms of building capacity. The main thing is today for Mauritius to be able to have capacity in terms of human resource who can develop these type of projects. We lack this, uh, a, a, we have a gap there in terms of the resource uh, uh, capacity. So we need that capacity building that to happen. That's one thing. 
Second part is, as uh, I think you mentioned it, that the triangle where you need to have reliability, affordability, and also sustainability. Very important is how to make the renewable energy affordable to the population. So this is where today we are looking at in terms of the technology that can be used to make it affordable. At the same time, it is sustainable and reliable. Because when we speak of reliability, the other issue is intermittency in renewable, uh, renewable sources. So how do you address that intermittency? If something can be worked out along that line, that will help. Because, I mean, government today is uh, targeting 35%, but ideally for an island like Mauritius, if we can go up to 100%, that would be great, you know? So if, if you can go 100%, then uh, we don't have to import the fossil fuel, we don't have to import the coal, so it's, it's a lot of saving in terms of foreign uh, reserve, foreign exchange that we can make. So that will be the technical aspect in terms of how we can address the intermittency. If that can be done, then, then it's a great thing for, for our country. So having said this, of course, there are opportunities, as I'm saying. Another opportunity which, from a producer's perspective, that we can look at, I mean, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador sold, uh, I would say, made a very good sale pitch about the Gambia. In terms of Mauritius, we are an access gate to the Eastern and Southern African region. So if producers, they come and produce the modules in Mauritius, they can export it to the region which is Sadek and Kumeza, duty-free, at preferential market access. So basically it's duty-free access if you're doing it in Mauritius and exporting it to the different regions, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. So that's a possibility that you can consider contemplating. And in terms of the attractive, attractiveness of Mauritius, we offer a very conducive investment and business environment as well. And the last point that I will take, just one minute, I know that you are pressed for time. So one minute, I will address my, my uh, observation to Ms. Anjali in terms of the financing. So most of the solar uh, renewable energy projects today, uh, they need a lot of financing. The financing comes uh, through bank financing today, but if there could be other modes and mechanisms of financing which, it, which makes it easier for projects to, to be able to come up with their uh, financing model, and also uh, in terms of selling or exporting the electricity that they're producing to the grid at a more affordable cost, that will help a lot. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, since we are running short of time, I don't think uh, there is uh, time for question and answer, but maybe one or two questions I can take if there is any. Otherwise, I will announce the session as closed. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Sean Bhatnagar. I'm based out of US. Uh, basic question is, in India, are you guys providing any training, like uh, ISA is any providing any training for solar system energy installation and all, like for villages. I mean, I was pretty impressed with uh, the Chutki project, you know, presented by Mr. Atul Bhatnagar. And I was wondering, I mean, if you guys can, you know, maybe throw some light on if there's some kind of training programs, you know, being imparted, so that would be very useful. Well, will you respond? Oh, yeah. okay, sorry. Do you I mean, uh, on the internet, there are like flocks of, I would say there's a lot of information for the training. But I would I would like to know if there is something sponsored by the ISA, some okay. focus program. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, what we are uh, trying to do is that we are partnering with National Institute of Solar Energy, uh, which in the campus where we are uh, headquartered right now, and also some of the associates like IIT Mumbai and some of the institutions in the eastern part of India. Uh, the idea is to have training of trainers. And in the first phase, we are trying to invite almost from each country who have signed and ratified. We are, uh, you know, to have this, that those who have ratified will have the first right, and then we will move to other countries. So 500 uh, uh, trainers will be trained, and from each country we will be picking up five uh, people. And we are just working on uh, the criteria as to what kind of qualification and requirement has to be there for participants, and whether ISA will play a role in selection or it will be left to the countries uh, to do their own selection of uh, participants, and what kind of facilities will be extended. Because there are tailor-made courses, some are very deep into it, deep dive. So you have three months program where the, some part is uh, uh, practical training uh, out of which, and there are theoretical classes. 
and there are some short programs as well on rooftop for example for entrepreneurs for bankers for distribution companies so different programs different requirements so isa is working on that and it is a very important um, element of our uh, you know because you cannot scale unless the entire ecosystem is developed and capacity building program is one of them and as we move forward we will be in touch and we will seek your guidance and support in scaling up the capacity building program also thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen um, i just add to it uh, what rakesh ji just said uh, now i was uh, previously the in in national skill development corporation now there we have created a sector skill council called the uh, council for green jobs solar is of course one big component there anyway so there are job roles which are defined and if you look up the website you will find a lot of jobs uh, job roles from there using the job roles you can then go to the nscc website and see which training partners are already imparting training in some of those so while uh, i say and uh, sorry uh, and ic is one of the very let's say leading bodies there but if you were to kind of get some training help in some remote parts of the country if you have an nscc certified provider you may be able to get your work done from there also uh, ladies and gentlemen due to shortage of time we won't be able to take any more questions further so uh, thank you so much sir i would like to come and thank you Uh, so to end the session, I would like to thank all our speakers, uh, Chairperson Sir, Her Excellency, His Excellency for uh, their insightful uh, information on solar sessions. Uh, so I would request now Chairperson Sir to, uh, with the help of my staff, give out the mementos to our speakers. I would start with Ms. Anjali Vishwamohanan. followed by Mr. Rohit Dhar. <laughs> Mr. Anuj Sess. Her Excellency Janaiba Jagne. Dr. T.S. Panwar. Mr. Atul Bhatnagar. Mr. Zakir Khan. And I would like, sir, to present one to His Excellency Mauritius. Now I would request Ms. Pallavi from the Exhibition India Group to present a memento to our chair, sir, Mr. Rakesh Kumar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this wonderful session on solar.